Okay, uh, looks like we're ready to go. I hope everyone's, uh, you know, awake this morning. And I was at the party last night, so i um, pretty impressed that you all rocked up. I'm uh, a little bit more impressed that my colleague Kevin showed up. Um, it was really good for me because um, the second half of the slides are all his and no one wants to listen to me for 40 minutes. Um, anyway, my name is Andy McRae. I'm a software developer working in the private cloud team at Rackspace. Um, and I work primarily on the OpenStack Ansible uh, project within OpenStack. Um, so that's an, an upstream project um, that we've got. Um, a little bit of history on, on the project. Um, it was a POC in the Havana timeframe that was actually started by Kevin. Um, and there were a couple of us uh, based out of the UK and, and uh, in America as well that then took that project a bit further and, and made it from a Rackspace only project to a more community and upstream project that we hope that everyone can use and that we'd, we'd love to see loads of people get involved in. Um, today, the aim of the talk is really to, to give you an idea of how the various components in OpenStack Ansible hang together. It can be a little bit difficult and daunting when you first look at it and it's, uh, you know, there's so many different things and it just seems too much and it's hard to get going and we'd like to give like a little bit of a kickstart on how, um, on how you get going with OpenStack Ansible um, and the various components that are involved and just how you get that going. There is documentation, but again, like you start looking at these reams of documentation and you're just like, I kind of want to give up. And we think if we give you a head start and give you some tips, uh, you'll be in a, a good place to, to start looking at it and get deploying with it. Because once you start, it's actually really easy. And once you've got your first deploy going, it, it gets a lot, lot easier. Um, so for those of you that aren't 100% familiar with OpenStack Ansible, um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what makes it different. So it's a deployment project. So deploying OpenStack using Ansible, um, that sounds quite intuitive, but <laughs> that's what it is. Um, there's a few differences uh, to a couple of the other deployment projects. Uh, for one, we use Alexi containers um, for some of the various infrastructure services for OpenStack. Um, we don't exclusively use containers. Um, but we do, we do put all the like, API services and various other infrastructure services in containers when it makes sense. Um, we also build from source, so we don't use packages from any vendors. Um, we, we will build a pip package, um, and uh, it'll be based on a SHA from the upstream repositories. Um, that's pretty cool because you get the code that was written um, by the developers, um, and that's what you get. You don't get anything on the side. You don't get any like, opinions of how it should be. It's just how it is in, in the repository, and we can like, fully customize it using Ansible after that in the configuration files. Uh, we also use virtual environments to split out the Python package installs um, within uh, the various containers and on the host themselves. And this is just for, to segregate out the packages so you keep the OS and the, uh, the various services separate. Our aim for the project is to support production deployments. Um, so this isn't a science project for us. We're not, we're not here to show that OpenStack can be deployed in containers. Um, like we did that at the start. We tried to put all the services in containers, and it was uh, you can get it to work with a couple uh, tricks and various things that are like I would say not good for a production install. Um, but we we already have uh, like production installs running OpenStack Ansible, um, and not just at Rackspace. There are various other people that have uh, started to use it very recently, um, and we've had really good feedback on it. Um, and and we want to keep it so that they can keep using it in production. Um, that upgrades uh, can happen, um, of course. That kind of depends on the OpenStack services themselves, but we do our best to make sure that the upgrade path is quite smooth and that uh, we utilize containers to make the upgrade path smooth. Uh, what's ex exciting recently is that we've had quite a few new contributors um, outside of Rackspace. So like I said, we started at Rackspace uh, during the Havana timeframe, and it was at first just an internal POC, and once we got it pushed up um, into the OpenStack namespace, which I think was in the Kilo timeframe. No. Do you know? Ah. So we got up in the OpenStack namespace in, in IceHouse. It was in StackForge. You know what I mean, so StackForge, and StackForge and IceHouse. And uh, since then, we, we tried to take out all the Rackspace uh, like elements of it. So we wanted to be like engaging for the rest of the community and not just a, a Rackspace, like this is what Rackspace does and you can use it if you want, but like we're not going to help you if you don't. Um, so we just wanted to make it so that we want other people involved. We want to make this project better with the community. And so we, we put a lot of effort into to making the project decoupled from Rackspace and removing all the kind of Rackspace-isms and all the, the kind of opinions we had. Um, and, and that seems to have paid off. In the last time frame, in the last six months, we've appointed our first two uh, core reviewers that are not Rackspace employees, um, which sounds like a minor thing, but it's pretty exciting when you've got a new project and um, you, you start getting contributors from all over um, you know, joining in. Okay, so 
let's get down to how do we deploy it. Um, so this is the quick and dirty guide, so I'm going to start with the quick and dirty way to deploy it. Um, there's really only five steps you need. Um, so the first step is you get yourself a server with Ubuntu 4.04, a 1404 rather. Um, you need at least 80 gigs of disk space, I think. Um, and, and then you, uh, I recommend, um, it can be anything. It can be a cloud server, a VM, or like a physical server. You just need 80 gigs of disk space. Um, step two, you do an app get update and you install uh, Git core. Um, I like to install Screen or Tmux as well, just because Keeps it <laughs> keeps it going for you. Um, step three, you clone the ans OpenStack Ansible repository. Um, step four, you run the commit gate check script. And step five, you go and do something with your time until the deploy finishes. And uh, so I was told by my US colleagues that when you finish a deploy, the American thing is to go boom. And it needs to be like crowd participation. But you're right because I'm not from the US. So in the UK we go, that was reasonably okay. And then we don't like do any crowd participation. Everyone sort of just has a cup of tea and walks away. Um, cool. So that's pretty much it. So that's a, a simple gate check deploy. We run this on all our gates. So whenever you do a commit to OpenStack Ansible, uh, this will run against it. Um, and it, it runs Tempest tests. So it's not just, oh, the deploy worked successfully. It actually tests uh, the OpenStack components as well. And so like a full end-to-end -end on, on one host. Uh, we've done some cool things with that. So for example, because it's only one host, you'd think I only get one uh, database server or I only get one rabbit server. But we want to test the clustering, like the Galera cluster and the rabbit cluster. So we use a setting called Affinity to create more than one container of that type. So you've actually got a full three node Galera cluster running on your single host um, for testing, which is uh, kind of cool. But at the end of the day, it's not useful for uh, you know, doing a, an actual deployment. Um, so the first thing you want to do when you're doing a, a manual install of like custom hardware and not just an AIO is you want to start setting up the containers. Um, so in general, I'm kind of against putting, you know, random comp files in slides because no one actually ever reads them. Um, but in this case, I just wanted to put one example of one. So it's literally just, we have a, a user config file called OpenStack user config. And it's just a definition of the hosts that you have, an IP to connect to them on. Um, and what kind of group you want them. So in the example in the slide, it's OS Infra Host, which is the OpenStack infrastructure host, which will be the various API servers. Um, as an example, if you just wanted Keystone, you could do identity hosts. Um, if you want your infrastructure services, so Galera, Rabbit, um, Memcache, and et cetera, you would do uh, Infra Hosts. Um, and it's, it's just a, a specification of the IP for the physical host. Um, and then using the dynamic inventory we have, it will munch that together with an environment file and it'll create the container hosts within the Ansible inventory file. So it'll then have hosts that it can target that will get created by the plays um, that are then for the various services. Um, so the OpenStack user config file is for uh, like your hardware definitions. So you also have to define um, your like network infrastructure. What are my interfaces called? What are my bridges called? Um, so one of the things that catches people out a little bit with the project is that we made a, a conscious decision right at the start to not handle your hardware setup. Um, we think that that makes a deployment project a lot more difficult because you could pick whatever hardware you want. We can't account for every um, like different scenario within a hardware configuration and we can't tell you and don't want to tell you how to set up your networking and how to um, you know set up your hardware and what hardware to use. And so we decided that we'll tell you what you need to have set up. So you need to have these networks set up and you know, you, if you want to use uh, LVs for your uh, containers, you need to have these uh, like LVs configured and, and various other things, but we're not going to do that setup for you. Um, so when you're setting up the network configuration, it's um, mostly about looking at your infrastructure, making sure that the correct bridges and interfaces are there, and then just con uh, setting the settings in the file to say what they are, um, including IP ranges and you know, various other things. This is actually the hardest part of deploying. Um, this, setting up this file correctly is pretty much the crux of what makes it slightly difficult or challenging for people um, because it, it is important to get it right. If you get it wrong, you're going to um, run into issues where you have containers in the wrong places or if you've put the same host twice with different IPs, you'll get um, random failures or a different name with the same IP and it'll try to do an app get update at the same time and you'll get failures for that. Um, so this is actually the hardest part, and I think this is probably the biggest barrier to entry for people because it, it, you need to get it right, and if you don't, it fails, and it's, it's quite daunting. There's a lot of settings for the networking stuff, but fortunately, we've created a sample file within the repository, so we do have like 
normal documentation, which is, uh, you know, just like on OpenStack docs. But within the repo, we've got sample files as well that are commented out with, uh, we hope, really helpful, um, you know, comments <laughs> on what each setting should be. Um, and, and yeah, those, it's a really good uh, resource to start looking at. Um, so the next thing is, I've set up my host and I've specified my hardware. How do I then specify how I want OpenStack to deploy? Um, the various settings within OpenStack that I'd like to see, um, the, the changes to defaults and various other things. Um, so we have a, a file called user variables, uh, which is pretty similar. It's just a, a definition of variables. Um, you don't actually have to set very many of them. We have adopted a principle where we want the default settings to be um, the OpenStack default as much as possible. Um, and so y the only time you have to change them is when it deviates from the default within OpenStack, which of course as like a production deploy you're going to want to do. Um, but it does mean that you, you should only have to change the ones you care about and not care about the others. Um, here's an example just in the file. It shows uh, you, know, you want to set Swift as your glance default store. Um, you want to use KVM as your NovaVert type. Uh, you want to set some allocation ratio things for, for Nova. Um, but there are var uh, variables for, for each of the projects. Um, and that's how you figure out what variables you can set. Um, there are a default file within each role. And uh, within the role, there's a list of variables. And those are the variables you can override within uh, the user variables. So this is on a deployment basis. So it'll be for the whole deployment. Uh, you can actually set container-specific variables. So if you wanted one container to have a variable that others don't, um, then you would do that in the user config file because that's for your, your hardware specifically. So it's specific to a specific host, and this would be specific to your deployment. And um, we use the host-specific uh, vars for things like Cinder, where you want to set Cinder backend type or your Cinder driver on a specific uh, container. Um, so there's one other file uh, that you'll need to set for customizing the deploy, which is your user secrets. Now, this is just the file containing all passwords and keys and various other settings that you should keep private. Um, the idea is that you could then encrypt this file using Ansible Vault or another tool, um, and then it'll just uh, run through successfully. Now, it's important to note that we actually don't set defaults for passwords. Uh, the reason being, it goes back to me, uh, what I said earlier, which was we want this for production deploys. And what often happens when you set default passwords is a deployer goes, oh, hey, I'll just run this thing. I forgot to set the passwords. And then you've got the super secret password of super secret. Um, and uh, we don't want that. And we've seen it in the past. And so we actually have no defaults for passwords. So if you don't set the user secrets file, it will uh, fail out. The deploy will fail when it tries to uh, find one of the password variables. Um, uh, but to help with that, we've created a, a nifty script that will create random passwords uh, within the file. So it'll set all the variables that are required with a random password based on the type of value they are. So for example, keys get a certain type of password and uh, passwords get a certain like length and uh, you know, a bit value for, for those. Alrighty, so that's pretty much the, the, the two files you need to actually play around with. And once you've done that, you're actually ready to start deploying. Um, there are a couple of ways you can deploy. Uh, in my opinion, the, the easiest way is probably still to, there's a script called run playbooks. Um, this actually gets called by uh, the, the gate check commit script. So there's three steps to the gate check commit script that I mentioned in, in the uh, first slide about deploying. The first bit is the bootstrap Ansible, uh, which is essentially a script that we created to install the right version of Ansible for the project, um, to create a, a binary that we've uh, made called OpenStack Ansible, which is pretty simple. It just chains in the correct variables files for you, so you don't have to keep doing dash E, variable file, variable file. You can just do OpenStack Ansible, playbook name, and it'll include the variable files that OpenStack Ansible uses. Um, so that's the first script that you would run in, in the gate check commit script. That's the first thing it runs, so you'd need to run that. The second one it does is the AIO, which, uh, the bootstrap AIO, which essentially lays down those files we just talked about. And then the third part is run playbooks. Um, so the run playbook script is, is quite useful because it will run the appropriate services for you. Uh, the service playbooks, it'll run them in the right order, and it'll also uh, do what we've created called the successorator. Um, so the successorator we created um, to, to help with a situation where there are upstream issues. For example, we've had issues uh, getting like keys for upstream repositories for various services or you know other dependencies on things that we can't control and they'll fail intermittently because there's like a connection issue or they're having issues on their side and uh, the failure would then mean oh, I have to see that it failed go back and do it again so we created a successorator which will just try the, the playbook again um, and and run through and if it really fails after three times I think it is then um, it, it'll just fail out but it also will start 
putting the output in verbose mode once it fails. So you don't have to go back and run it in verbose, it'll do it for you, and you can then see the output of, of where it failed um, from Ansible. So I like using that script. You can also um, edit the, the script itself. There's some uh, environment variables that you can set to, in, to check which uh, services you want deployed and which ones you don't want deployed. Um, and, and that's pretty useful as well. Because there are some services like Solometer or, or even Swift or uh, a couple of the others that, t uh, Tempest is a good example, that you don't really want to deploy or you may not want to deploy. Um, and, and it's like a, a user you know, preference thing. Um, cool. So the other way is, if you don't want to use the script, you can use the playbooks directly. There are essentially three groups of playbooks. There's the host setup, which is essentially install the packages um, that the host requires in order to run. Um, the next one is, in, uh, well, also create the Galaxy containers. That's part of the host setup. The second one is install the infrastructure services, which is uh, like Memcache, Galera, Rabbit. Um, I think that's it. And then the third one is install the OpenStack services. So it'll install the OpenStack services within a container. So this is useful because if, if say, you had a configuration issue with, uh, let's say, Keystone, I don't want to have to run through all the host setup plays and all the infrastructure setup plays in order to then run Keystone again and have that succeed. Because all the other sets of plays have already succeeded. So I could then just run the OpenStack setup uh, play and it will do Keystone and the services after that. Or if it happened further on down the line in, for example, Swift, which I think is the last one to get set up, uh, you could just rerun the Swift play itself. So there's quite a granularity on that. Um, and, and that's a pretty good way to go about like, efficiently deploying if, you, if you're running into failures that you're fixing on the first go. Um, so yeah, there, there's that option to just use the individual playbooks. All right, so you've got a deploy running and it's custom and everything's great. Um, but now you want to drop some servers that are dead or you, you don't need anymore or you want to repurpose them or something like that. There's, you know, you want to add, maybe you want to add new servers, it's probably more likely, or you want to change some settings. Um, so that's actually quite easy when it comes to adding or changing servers um, because we have what's called a dynamic inventory script, which will essentially take the existing inventory, uh, compare it to your OpenStack user config and the environments file, which is a definition of where containers go on what hosts and what groups they belong to. And it will say, these are new servers, let's add them to the inventory. Or these settings change, let's add them to the inventory. So that's really straightforward. All you do is add them to the user config, um, and off you go. Removing servers is a little bit more difficult. Um, the problem with that is that the inventory file already exists. And so the entry for that host is in the inventory file. And if you remove it from the user config file, it will still compare it to the inventory and say, it's in the inventory, I'm going to leave it there, I'm not going to remove it. Um, we did this on purpose because we don't want people running it accidentally with no user config file and then removing all their servers. Um, and that's pretty much what would happen. So removing servers has to be a much more manual effort. Um, but to help, we've created a script called uh, the inventory manage script, uh, which is inside the scripts directory in the repository. And it's got a help function so you can look through. But essentially, you can delete nodes by using the inventory manage script, and you can remove the containers, and then you can run and it will, will work fine. I'll give over to Kevin now. <laughs> hey, how's it going? So uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Carter. I'm also a developer with Andy at Rackspace Private Cloud and working on OpenStack Ansible. So again, welcome. But uh, to change it up, uh, we're top, like, as Andy has been saying, we have the ability to deploy OpenStack and then rethink how that deployment was done from the very beginning. Like, if uh, Andy showed a picture of the uh, allocation ratios for Nova early on, and if I wanted to change that, like six months after my deployment, I can certainly do that. Uh, I can do that with any service. I can do that with anything that we support and how we support it. Um, and essentially, by, by modifying or editing the, the user variables, we're able to uh, customize the deployment for the deployment needs. So uh, that, that actually becomes important later on in life because, uh, again, like the Nova alloc allocation ratios, if maybe I want a specific host to uh, have a certain allocation ratio or I want to be able to attach to a different uh, storage backend. But we have that uh, baked into the system. And to help with that, you can run OpenStack Ansible, the name of the playbook, and a tag. So your, uh, an example of a tag would be uh, for Keystone. If I wanted to reconfigure Keystone and then restart all the services across the entire environment, would be the Keystone conf tag. So run OpenStack Ansible, OS Keystone install, Keystone conf. Uh, a couple of tasks go by, and then all the services restart, and you're up and running with that new config. So we have the option to be able to customize everything from, from the top down. 
Now, <laughs> with OpenStack Ansible, uh, you can actually modify, add things, remove things, change your deployment up, and that can be done from, uh, well, uh, you can do that from the core. And the environment file, uh, as Annie had alluded to, allows you to uh, add a service that we may not already support. We may, like uh, one of the services that we're working on now is Zakar. And so let's say I wanted to be able to deploy Zakar, you could be able to go, or be able to go into your environment file, add the Zakar services, and then carry on with our role that is being developed upstream. Now, the environment file is a little bit hard to understand because it is, it's a YAML file, um, and it, it, it brings up a whole bunch of different little primitives. But again, we have an example of how that works, why it works, and um, once you uh, begin to understand how the rest of the deployment is put together, it becomes really simple to extend. Now, uh, in OpenStack, I mean, the rate of change in OpenStack is, is, is immense, right? from where we were a few years ago to where we are today, the amount of options or things you can change up is never ending. Um, so we have a, 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 or a tool as a module called uh, the config template. And that allows you to uh, reach into any conf file, INI file, YAML file, JSON file, and change bits. You can add keys, add, add values, uh, add entire, or entirely new sections. And, and that gives you the option to, like, we may not have a templated variable for you for that specific option. We may not have um, some sane default that we're generating for you for that specific option. But the config template will allow you to go in and, and add that. And then you can push that out to production today. Um, that, that module is being uh, pr to Ansible Core, and I'm hope, hope, hopeful it can get in for uh, 2.1, but we'll see. It's been there for a little while. But the uh, other projects have adopted that, like Ceph Ansible. Uh, they have a very similar uh, capability to be able to inject configuration options into their environment, and that's using the config template module. So it's, a, it's exciting to be able to get that kind of a dynamic environment um, and, and be able to push that out at a very large scale without having a template option for every single config thing that could p potentially be done. And I think in Nova, it's something like, 1,800 potential combinations. And so we, yeah, we, we, we want to, or we will template and produce the thing that will give you a production-ready deployment. If you want to customize that again to do anything you want, we can do that. So uh, like Annie was mentioning, we're in the uh, OpenStack namespace, and we're a community project, uh, and we want to help you. Um, if you need assistance with your deployment, uh, we are on OpenStack Ansible on Freenode, uh, and our community is growing every day. We, uh, myself, Andy, uh, we're in IRC, and uh, we're, 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 we're building a very uh, awesome community uh, that is friendly and super helpful for one another. One of the really cool things as somebody who had, you know, helped start this project and get it going is to actually see people who uh, I don't work with, I don't know, helping other people I don't work with and I don't know. Um, and so uh, uh, the community is growing. Um, we're, uh, you, we use the uh, dev mailing list and the uh, operator mailing list for some of our community uh, discussions that we're, we want to float out there and let people ponder on. But most of our conversations happen on IRC. Um, we've also painstakingly at times decided uh, or created documentation. And uh, Andy had alluded to our uh, rafts of documentation that we have and uh, at docs.openstack.org, we, we do, we have pages and pages of documentation on how all of this gets put together, why it works, and some uh, you know, helpful, helpful things like restarting a Galera cluster or recovering from a failure, because um, we want to be able to uh, have production-ready OpenStack, but the reality is things break, and you're going to have to deal with that, and we've created documentation on how you can, how you can recover from these kind of situations and or extend. So, uh, we are hopeful that those docs are helpful. So looking forward, um, OpenStack Ansible has come a long way, especially if you go and look at the tragedy I created in the Ice House time frame. Um, it, it's actually, it's, it's, it's quite nice now. Um, but the, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at trying to uh, do more with the project and do it faster. Um, make uh, 
and make things more stable. I mean, we're, we're, we're already putting this in production. We have very large clouds running this code today. But it can always be better, and we're always going to extend it. And so one of the things that we have done uh, in this last cycle was uh, something that we called the independent role repositories, where we, we took every single one of the roles and made it its own independent repository, which is all on the OpenStack namespace. With that, you can, you, you can work. The idea was that you'd be able to work on something like Keystone as just Keystone, um, and like not have to incorporate all of the changes of OpenStack Ansible in this like giant deployment. If I only wanted to work on Keystone, and I only wanted to uh, see how the code is deployed and or work on that role, you can work on it from the Keystone role. Now, one of the really cool things that we did with that, actually, is that we started gate testing on every single one of those roles. And so it's creating like a little micro cloud by running that role. And that's something we call developer mode. Um, so uh, and like in one of the, actually another good example would be Swift. Like Swift is not, uh, it's, uh, it's a complex service, but we're going to set all of that up for you on a single node in developer mode, which pulls down the source from Git, builds a little VAM, couple of containers, and then runs the Swift functional tests on it. Um, that is essentially a, 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 it's actually a really nice developer workflow, especially if you're looking at, like, I want to work on upstream Swift. Um, so the independent role repository has enabled a lot of that for us, and we're going to continue with that and be able to add more services, whether that be Designate, Zakar, um, what are the, some of the other ones we're working on? There's, there's Salometer. Um, Ironic. Ironic is currently under development right now. Um, it's mostly there. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you, must, you would have seen a rant I had a couple weeks back about my success with Ironic. But anyways, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be continuing that trend as we, uh, as we move forward, as we roll forward. Um, we're also looking to start working with Ansible 2. Right now, we rely on Ansible 1.9. Four, um, well, I think 196 was broke for us, so if they do 197, we'll rely on that. Uh, but yeah, 194 at this time. Uh, 2.x is something that we're looking at going to in the next cycle or two, um, but also maintaining support for some of our 1.9 installations. Um, so Ansible 2 is actually kind of exciting for us because um, some of the new modules that they're going to produce may help with some of the pain points that we had earlier on, uh, especially in terms of the network setup if we can help out in that by using some of those core modules, then I think that'll go a long way for uh, easing uh, adoption. But yeah, Ansible 2 is, uh, is going to be a, a good thing for us. Another thing we're working on is uh, Ubuntu 16.04, and it was just dropped. But uh, we are hopefully going to have 16.04 support within this cycle, but we also be able to deploy against 14.04 as well. So we're one of the, another thing that we have done and we will continue to do is to be able to upgrade and support our, our environment from the, the, the point of time when you deployed it. And so, like, uh, we had Icehouse customers, and we've upgraded them to Juno, we've upgraded them to Kilo, and we're going to upgrade them to Liberty, and we'll upgrade them to Taka. And so, we, in, by, doing, by, by forcing us to uh, be able to upgrade these environments, we're... Yeah, we're going to make mistakes. Things are going to happen, but we're going to always be able to help our deployers come forward. And so, in looking forward, we're going to continue that trend and try to make things even easier. So, I have no more slides, but uh, that is the quick and dirty talk of OpenStack Ansible, and I would love to uh, um, have questions and engage the audience. Maybe we can get a boom. Anybody? Bueller? Yeah. So you, you mentioned that you're expecting the base operating system and I guess the network configuration to be all set up. What's the minimum sort of baseline that you would be looking for in order to, uh, to use your, your, your deployment software? Uh, so the, the minimum base, like the amount of RAM, disk space, and number of hosts, or? Um, <clears throat> more in terms of you know what what these machines have to be configured with. I mean, you you mentioned the network, for example. Mm -hmm. um, does it take care of all the you know your Galera replication, all this ah. kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah. So yes, uh, our OpenStack Ansible project will set up a Galera cluster for you. Um, if you have Galera cluster X Y Z over here, we'll go and talk to it. Um, but if you don't have that, we'll we'll produce it for you. 
And we think we have done a really good job at making that scalable and fast. Um, we'll also do that with RabbitMQ. Um, and if you're using Solometer, MongoDB. Um, and, but on all of those things, it is a connection string. And so if you have uh, an amazing MongoDB cluster over here, I'm like, well, oh, go talk to that. Um, like, we're not going to enforce our infrastructure choices on you for that. Um, in terms of networking, the, the reality is, is that we've simplified what we require from a network perspective to a collection of bridges. So, um, and we've named them in very not creative ways, like BR management, BR VLAN, BR flat, um, and they all have a very specific purpose. Now, uh, you don't need any of them. They're arbitrary names, but yeah, to, to your point, uh, we'll, we'll set up what you need. Um, otherwise, uh, networking is kind of on you. Yeah. Uh, do you also set up HA proxy or some, uh, some other thing to, to worry about the load balancing HA? Yeah, actually, so uh, OpenStack Ansible will set up HA proxy for you if you don't have a load balancer already. At Rackspace Private Cloud, we're using F5s, um, and so all of our deployments have an F5 in front of it. Um, but uh, again, we'll, we'll integrate with that, because uh, we, we don't feel like that is a, a piece of the technology that must be forced upon you. Like, if you have a, um, an amazing router over here or a load balancer over there, go, go, we'll use that. Uh, we're not going to set it up for you, but uh, we'll, we'll set up the environment to consume that. Now, in the HA proxy kind of setup, though, uh, we'll set up ACLs and uh, HA proxy, and, and we also have, uh, what is it, Keep Alive D set up so that uh, you can use HR, have multiple HA proxy nodes. Uh, in this cycle, I have a patch set currently online to introduce customizable ACLs and SSL termination for all of the, all of the public services using HA proxy. Um, but yeah, yeah, we do have HA proxy set up. And uh, thank you. And how do you find the troubleshooting of the services when they're in the uh, containers? Not specifically Ansible, but it seems like it could be a little bit more difficult to get yeah. in there with. Uh, so uh, in the deployment, one of the aspects of our deployment is a logging node. Um, and so all of our logs get published from the various services, various containers and hosts out to our logging node. And you can you can actually put your analytic system against that and start sucking out data from that, or you can tail dash F and watch a stream of consciousness fly by um, if, you, if you really wanted to. In terms of troubleshooting, a lot of the time, the issues with a service is uh, it was misconfigured or um, you're, you're, on the, you're on the bleeding edge and it stack traces and died. Uh, to be able to troubleshoot that, you, you have to log into the container. Uh, we're using LXC. Um, so that's a machine container. That is a, that is a lightweight VM. So you can SSH into it. All of your GNU tools are there, um, and you can carry on uh, troubleshooting. I find it simple. Um, I do know that uh, it is building a fairly large cloud. Um, Andy mentioned our all-in-one earlier on. Um, that is building a 32-node cloud with a single hypervisor, which is the host. Um, and so, yeah, you are, you, you're interacting with more services. But um, a lot of that brings us stability and scale. So, Hi. Uh, could you talk about a little bit the differences in relationship with OpenStack Cola? Uh, we haven't. Uh, I mean, early on, we talked with the guys from Cola, Stephen Dake and uh, um, uh, Mihail, uh, Sam Yappel, um, Daniel Hansen. Uh, we talked to them a lot. They decided to go with the Docker technologies as their core, their fundamental core. Uh, we're using. OpenStack, uh, we're using Ansible for Ansible and LXE containers, and so we haven't, we haven't talked to them a lot recently, but uh, we, we did work together early on. Um, we're both solving a very similar problem. Uh, we have just chosen different fundamental technologies. Okay, would you say you're closer to upstream or the same or? I, I don't know that we're the same. I haven't looked at them in a long time. Okay. Um, I do know that we've, We've done very large deployments with OpenStack Ansible today, uh, and we've done it across multiple regions. Um, I, I don't know what their, their, their system is capable of at this time. Uh, the last time I looked at it, they were still using Docker Compose in, in the Kilo Liberty time frame, and so uh, I don't know how far they've come. So I, I, I couldn't answer that, honestly. Thank you. Yeah, of course. 
You said that um, you can point your deployment to any da uh, running database, a MongoDB or uh, Galera cluster. Is that uh, possible to point it to an already running co uh, cluster and take it over? Like a uh, cluster deployed with something else and just swap the database and uh, the control plane between themselves? I'm going to say yes-ish. Like, uh, well, so, and, and the reason is uh, we can turn on and off the LXC containers. Um, and the, uh, if you had a running Galera cluster over here and it was on bare metal, you could turn off the LXC containers and point our system at that and it would take it over. Um, uh, the ish part comes because uh, like who knows how that was set up, what's the config like, um, are you dropping extra comp files that are being sourced into the main MyCNF file, like there, there's, there's various things that are going to come into play there that we probably, uh, we can integrate with but may cause a problem. So. Uh, I'm not thinking about taking over the Galera cluster, but actually uh, swapping the control plane, so all the APIs, all the uh, Nova scheduler, uh, Nova conductor, everything from what was deployed with our old, uh, old tooling and oh. now using OpenStack Ansible for everything else except the database. That should work. Uh, the host name stuff would, like uh, when you go in like a Nova service list, you're going to see a bunch of host names. All that's going to need to be probably munged about. But that's all OpenStack API services. We're not going to take care of that for you. Um, so I want to say, uh, I think the answer still stands. Yes-ish. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> uh, could you give some details on the log node setup that you just mentioned? Thanks. Uh, the log node setup. So I think we've just gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can that. do that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the log node setup is actually quite simple. It is a R syslog server, um, and all of the services use R syslog to publish logs to it. Uh, we did actually use, I think it's called the IDT plugin, uh, which allows us to create a, or a directory for every host name that is attaching back to our R syslog server. And so it is not just one massive file. It is lots of massive files, um, but they, uh, uh, they're, it's, it's all very separated, so um, I, again, if I wanted to tail F the logs, I could do that for all the services, or I could do it for that one specific host that's causing me a problem. Um, and that's all being done by very, very simple RSYS log setups. But the plugins work for RSYS log as well. Uh, yeah, and actually, that's a good point. Um, and uh, in our RSYS log client role, uh, we can, and we tested with Splunk and Logly, um, and we're just using RSYS log to shove logs over there. And there's an example in the default YAML file that shows you how to do that and why it works. Um, and that can be all over SSL to log service XYZ, as long as they support the, uh, our, well, as long as they support our syslog. Yeah. Uh, how do you, um, well, I'm a puppet guy, so I'm used to things running, to it running constantly and being idempotent and stuff. Uh, do you run it, do you run Ansible periodically to make sure everything is in a known state, or is there another way to handle that? Um, I'm going to say we don't um, run it periodically. Um, I, I think the, the ideal is that you want to keep up to date with the bug fixes and, and various other things, so it would be a good idea to run it, um, but not so much because you just want to keep the state the same, more because you want to actually be updating or, or updating fixes and, uh, you know, OpenStack itself as well um, and various other reasons. Um, with the container approach, we Kevin uh, talked about troubleshooting a little bit, but um, one of the things that if you're not super interested in why it failed, we actually kind of recommend just deleting the container and building it again. Um, for containers that aren't like Galera where it's a cluster, just like API services. So we're kind of of the mindset that um, you shouldn't need to keep setting the config on those things. Like no one should be logging in there and changing stuff. Um, but I mean, we used to do the, the chef thing and, and that was pretty much the same. So um, it, it does work, but... Um, our opinion is that you shouldn't be changing those, and that can be a little bit naive if people are going to go in and change them, but then when services stop working, you can either just delete the container and build a new one, or troubleshoot it if you, you're really interested into why it's failing. Like, if it's failing all the time and you keep rebuilding it, then it's probably worth troubleshooting, so I hope that answers it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my question is, how do you handle um, service upgrades? For example, a new version of OpenStack comes out. Um, is it a new version of your playbooks that you have to check out um, over GitHub and rerun, or is it some version parameter you can plug in that'll pull down the correct source files? 
Um, so actually both in a way. Um, so the settings for the SHA for OpenStack, the OpenStack like uh, SHA for the repositories is is a variable. Um, so you could technically deploy using like Kilo and set the SHAs to be uh, you know, Liberty or Mataka. Um, that would probably be not advised, but you could do it. Um, so you could not download anything extra from OpenStack Ansible and just change those SHA variables. Um, but we update the SHAs regularly when we, when we uh, you know, as we go um, to keep it kind of tracking. Um, and so you could download the latest version of OpenStack Ansible, you'll get new SHAs, and then when you deploy, you'll also get the, any bug fixes we've done within OpenStack Ansible. So I think it would be a bad idea to just change the SHA and not um, update everything else because uh, it might not work. We're not going to say it does. So, yeah. Uh, great. I'll actually expand on that a little bit, but uh, in, in terms of like OpenStack service upgrades, um, since Liberty, all of our OpenStack services are, not only are they deployed in a container, but they're also inside of a virtual environment. And so when we go and drop down new code, really the only thing that is changing to get that new code running is the init script. Um, and we rewire that to point at the new vem. Um, and so we've done that to isolate OpenStack's Python bits from the host machine, because uh, Linux operating systems depend on Python. And so we don't want the OpenStack versions of things conflicting with the vendored versions of things from Ubuntu or Red Hat or whoever. Um, a lot of the upgrade logic, like the business logic for upgrades, because um, uh, we're going to change the version of MariaDB eventually. Uh, we're going to change RabbitMQ version. We take care of that upgrade in the role for you. And so if the RabbitMQ version is new that will be installed today, it will go in and install that and then bring that cluster up to date with the new code, um, maintaining uptime. And, and that's all part of the role, um, so from an infrastructure perspective. Um, so we're getting kicked off the stage now. <laughs> so uh, if you've still got questions, feel free to come talk to us afterwards. We'll uh, probably be outside because there's another talk <laughs> in, in eight minutes now. <laughs>